PhD cum laude in 2006 from University of Twente on 3D scaffolds for osteochondral regeneration, where he was awarded the European Doctorate Award in Biometrics and Tissue Engineering from the European Society of Biometrics. Since 2014, he's a professor at Maastricht University and a founding member of the Merlin Institute of Technology Inspired Regenerative Medicine. In 2016, he became full professor in biofabrication for regenerative medicine. He's received numerous awards. In 2014, he received the John Leary Award from the ESP and an ERC starting grant. In 2016, he received the Robert Brown Award from Thermis. In 2017, he was elected as faculty of the Young Academy of Europe in the top 100 Italian scientists within 40 worldwide by the European Institute of Italian Culture. His research group works at developing biofabrication technologies to regenerate libraries of 3D scaffolds able to control sulfate with applications from skeletal to vascular, neural, and organ regeneration. His research group and efforts resulted in three uh, products that reached the market. The floor is yours, Lorenzo. Thank you, Mehmet. Uh, thank you again for, uh, for the very kind uh, um, introduction and, for, uh, and thanks to you and to Ali for the invitation to talk uh, to, uh, to all of you today uh, at the Terazaki Institute. Uh, it's a great privilege for, uh, for me to have this opportunity and uh, I'd like to show uh, some of the past and, uh, and some of the current uh, science uh, also giving a glimpse to uh, where we are heading to. Uh, in the future. Uh, now, while, uh, while preparing the talk, uh, uh, for those of you that probably also were uh, connected earlier, uh, I, I already mentioned that, uh, and while discussing with uh, Mehmet uh, on, on the angle of the talk, I decided also to show uh, some of the very old data of ours that nowadays are currently in clinical trials. And so with, with, the, with the scope actually also to show uh, on one side the, what actually uh, is, uh, has been so promising to, uh, to make it to the patient, but also the, the relatively long trajectory that it takes uh, to, uh, to make that happening. Now, the overarching uh, uh, goal that I hope uh, you will uh, uh, bring back uh, from, uh, from this hour together is that uh, ultimately we use biomaterial knowledge and uh, uh, processing technologies to create scaffolds, to design and create scaffolds that can steer cell activity. And in most of the cases, uh, stem cell activity. And in, in doing this, uh, we uh, have been uh, interested more and more in the role of uh, biofabrication technologies. Now, what are these biofabrication technologies? There has been a lot of different uh, uh, opinions and uh, angles on uh, what is biofabrication nowadays, especially in the context of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. It took us uh, quite some time, but uh, in the end, we have also been able to uh, bring together a, a number of different uh, uh, key opinion leaders in the field, uh, essentially uh, redefining uh, the uh, field in two main pillars and an exception. And I'll, I'll talk first about the two main pillars, which are the well-known bioprinting and bioassembly, where in, uh, in bioprinting we aim at uh, uh, direct uh, the, the spatial arrangement of uh, cells, materials, and uh, uh, eventually biological factors. Or in bioassembly, we uh, aim at creating a sort of mini biological Lego blocks, if you like, that again can be uh, placed together to recreate a macroscopic uh, tissue um, in the end, uh, uh, you know, to make it uh, fashion. Now, in both cases, uh, this uh, uh, biological constructs goes in, uh, onto a period of uh, maturation, and then uh, they can be either implanted for, for, again, regenerative medicine purposes or used as a 3D-dimensional advanced in vitro model, uh, for example, for uh, pharmaceutical or toxicological uh, uh, screening applications. I did talk about an exception, and the exception actually is also where uh, scaffolds that can be a cellular design and that um, provides uh, either hierarchical or surface engineered properties able to direct uh, stem cell activity into a desired uh, task uh, in the context of regeneration of, a of the regeneration of a tissue uh, is also considered as a part of biofabrication nowadays. You see here the three classical uh, uh, or, or most often applied uh, uh, technological platforms uh, with, with bioprinting. Everything started from additive manufacturing uh, technologies in the uh, early or mid early uh, 80s. Um, which has been actually hijacked in a way uh, into a, a bioprinting concept in the early uh, years of the 21st century. 
um, by the group of Vladimir Mironov and, and uh, Thomas uh, Bolan. Electrospinning is certainly uh, getting more and more um, uh, traction force in uh, designing scaffolds that uh, uh, mimic the um, physical organization and dimensions of uh, our the fibrillar component of our uh, tissues, essentially our collagen fibers and bottom-up approaches are uh, the kind of uh, technologies where, again, these kind of biological Lego blocks uh, um, come together into a more macroscopic uh, uh, tissue. In fact, actually, one of the most inspiring paper uh, a few years uh, uh, back in the uh, memory line is actually from uh, your director, uh, Ali, uh, who, who actually certainly inspired the field uh, in, uh, in that uh, on that angle, among other uh, topics. Uh, now, uh, where actually uh, additive manufacturing uh, uh, technologies in, you know, impact the field of biofabrication, you see uh, here also an attempt to define uh, uh, them in terms of uh, their resolution, uh, correlating that uh, to uh, the speed of fabrication. And again, also here, certainly in the last uh, couple of years, we have seen and witnessed uh, a lot of technological advancement, uh, also, for example, moving from uh, the classical layer by layer methodology to a more volumetric bioprinting uh, uh, modality, which uh, results in, uh, in certainly uh, increasing significantly the speed of fabrication uh, while maintaining a, a resolution similar to the single cell um, features. However, if you look at uh, some of the criteria that clinically are relevant, not always biofabrication technologies could be um, necessarily the, the magic uh, bullet uh, that will solve uh, the, the issue. So here, actually, I'd like to show uh, some of the indeed uh, a first example of the uh, most the, the oldest work of ours. Uh, where um, by simply looking at uh, the structural properties of uh, uh, 3D printed scaffolds here, uh, represented by the porosity, the overall porosity of the scaffolds, uh, in combination with the polymer chemistry, such as the mesh size, uh, we can actually recreate a sort of a predictive model, uh, interpolating experimental and theoretical uh, uh, knowledge, uh, where uh, we can then re uh, the, the select the um, proper structural and chemistry of a uh, defined scaffold to um, select the, uh, the uh, desired mechanical properties of, the of that scaffold. And this actually certainly is important for skeletal applications, uh, such as in the case of articular cartilage defects, where indeed, uh, if we then select also a um, polymer chemistry, uh, that uh, would desirably uh, be biodegradable in the course of a year from implantation, uh, we could interpolate then with 3D printing technology uh, the proper chemistry with the proper structure to create uh, scaffolds that have the same dynamic stiffness as uh, articular cartilage. Now, this uh, polymer of uh, choice uh, has also uh, uh, been already used in the past uh, as a medical device uh, for uh, uh, different kind of biomedical applications and therefore already having uh, a master file at FDA certainly resulted in a uh, better knowledge of the polymer itself in terms of safety and biocompatibility and therefore uh, in a, um, a faster route towards uh, um, uh, its application to the clinic. Uh, specifically, we have used uh, a uh, polyethylene oxide terephthalate, uh, uh, polybutylene terephthalate copolymer uh, with a 70% weight, 30% uh, weight uh, uh, ratio between the two uh, polymers in the copolymer formulation. Now, if indeed uh, you uh, use different kinds of cells, either being uh, uh, a classical bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells or uh, uh, adult primary cells such as chondrocytes or osteoblasts into these uh, scaffolds, in principle, you can create a number of different kinds of engineered tissues uh, according to the more conventional uh, tissue engineering principles. Um, one of this uh, uh, combination actually resulted in uh, the creation of uh, high quality cartilage uh, when uh, specifically uh, a four to one ratio between uh, primary chondrocytes and uh, adult uh, stem cells uh, uh, has been used on this kind of mechanically optimized uh, um, scaffolds. 
And so in fact, actually from uh, in initial in vitro data, uh, if we look at uh, this composition, uh, 70, 30 composition in either a matching uh, porosity, uh, so the 56% uh, group here on the uh, graph or a non-matching uh, porosity in the, the, the middle group uh, in the graph, we did see actually that there has been an increase in uh, one of the classical uh, initial markers to um, qualify the uh, quality of the tissue form in the case of, of, in this case, again, of articular cartilage being glycosaminoglycans. So we have also used a different kind of composition of the same copolymer family here represented by the 55-45 group. So a different ratio of the POT and PBT blocks uh, showing actually, again, a similar a lower gag formation uh, uh, relative to the 70-30 um, the, the chemistry in, again, the non-mechanically matching uh, configuration. What actually is also important is that uh, the uh, chemistry of choice uh, not only result in a better uh, gag formation when the scaffold structure is mechanically optimized, but also in uh, a uh, better uh, chondrocyte morphology uh, when the cells actually are seeded on uh, these kind of scaffolds, whereas the 5545 um, chemistry resulted in a much more uh, spread cell um, uh, morphology. This has been now almost a decade ago. And in the meantime, a number of different in vivo studies have been also performed, which has also led to the formation of a uh, spin-off company at a time uh, uh, when the group actually was uh, um, situated at Twente University, uh, where then the, con the same concept was uh, uh, translated to uh, clinical trials. And now about, about 300 patients actually are walking on these kind of scaffolds, uh, which have been uh, filled uh, with the same uh, uh, chondrocyte to MSC uh, co-culture ratio. You see here some of the um, initial data from uh, the uh, clinical trials that have been uh, performed with this uh, new uh, concept that have, have become in the meantime a product where actually uh, 12 months from the implantation, about 72% of the biopsy, biopsies showed the uh, hyaline cartilage formation uh, and 97% uh, a, a mix between fibro and hyaline cartilage. Whereas uh, to remember uh, most of the uh, clinically available product uh, for uh, cartilage uh, um, regeneration, such as uh, autologous chondrocyte implantation or matrix assisted autologous chondrocyte implantation still after uh, one, uh, one year, one to two years from implantation uh, do um, show a degeneration of the hyaline cartilage back into uh, fibro fibrotic cartilage actually. More importantly, uh, the uh, quality of life uh, uh, score of the uh, patients uh, continues to increase uh, in uh, uh, the years after the uh, surgery. Well, you see again here, uh, the, the graph showing uh, an increasing quality of life uh, up to two years uh, from the uh, surgery. Now, this actually is certainly interesting and nice uh, from, a, uh, from those cases. In those cases where um, the degeneration of uh, a, a joint tissue only happens in uh, the uh, superficial cartilage layer. So in the, it is, a, in a way, a focal uh, cartilage defect. Uh, in many cases, uh, however, in, uh, in our body and certainly also in our joints, uh, uh, tissues are um, often uh, um, uh, characterized by uh, different kinds of gradients, not only biological gradients, but also physiochemical and structural gradients. Examples are also uh, typically tendons or ligaments to maintain uh, the focus on uh, the musculoskeletal system. You see here a classical case of uh, um, how different biological signals are differentially expressed in a uh, tendon moving actually towards the insertion into the uh, bony side where it will be anchored. <clears throat> now, from a um, scaffold technology point of view, uh, in many cases, these kind of gradients have been discretized in uh, different kind of regions um, where uh, many scientists have uh, uh, tried to then mimic in these different regions the different kind of structural and physiochemical properties more than the biological properties of uh, the resulting uh, scaffolds uh, to be used. Now, with 3D printing technologies, we have also done something uh, along this line where uh, we used actually uh, the technology to try to recreate uh, uh, different kind of uh, local oxygen environments by changing 
in, in a discrete manner the porosity of the scaffolds from uh, low pores to large pores, uh, thinking that in this way, as the cells would start to populate uh, the uh, scaffolds in the different regions, we would automatically create uh, a gradient in uh, uh, the oxygen present to the cells uh, simply by inducing uh, more oxygen consumption on the uh, low pore size and uh, less oxygen consumption in the large pore size. And this actually has been one of the uh, central question of a former PhD student of mine, uh, Andrea Di Luca, uh, who is now a, a manager um, at a consulting company looking at uh, translation again of regenerative medicine uh, uh, approaches uh, to uh, the clinic. What actually Andrea uh, did was then to create these kind of gradients and uh, compare them to non-gradient scaffolds where the pores were homogeneous, either in the largest or in the lowest uh, pore size of the gradient scaffolds. And again, looking simply at uh, ALP or GAG for osteogenic and uh, chondrogenic uh, um, differentiation of the CD MSCs, uh, he saw indeed that uh, there was an increase of the ALP activity after five weeks of culture in the gradient scaffolds compared to the homogeneous uh, scaffolds. If you now cut the gradient scaffold in the different subregions, this resulted in an increase of the ALP activity with increasing of the pore size. Diverse again for, uh, for cartilage, uh, he uh, showed actually a, an increase of the gag content for both the uh, gradient and the non-gradient scaffold with the lowest pore size. And again, if uh, uh, he would cut the gradient scaffold, he would see that this uh, 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 increase in gag formation is now inversely proportional to the uh, pore dimension. So the highest with the lowest pores. In a way, uh, partially confirming the original hypothesis that we had. Now, is this really connected to uh, oxygen? It seems uh, the case that we have looked also at the expression of uh, hypoxia inducible factor, one alpha and uh, two alpha, which are the two main uh, most uh, splicing uh, uh, variables of, of a protein that is uh, clearly connected to hypoxic conditions. And again, Andrea showed that this uh, protein to be much more highly secreted into the uh, lowest uh, pore size areas of the gradient scaffolds uh, compared to the largest uh, pore size. And again, here you see also that the two alpha splicing is, uh, uh, has the same uh, trend. Now, these uh, um, scaffolds are still uh, uh, discretized. As I said at the beginning of this uh, part of the talk where we are interested to recreate uh, gradients in, uh, uh, in a similar manner into our body, uh, ideally with this kind of gradients uh, should be also um, continues as it does happen in, uh, in our body. And, and for this, actually, there has not been yet a, uh, an additive manufacturing technology that would be able to change the physiochemical properties of uh, a uh, fabricated scaffold on the fly while printing. And see, this actually was also the effort or within the context of a European project that uh, ran in the lab in the last uh, six years, where actually Ravi uh, Singh, a postdoc in the lab, um, uh, was able to, uh, in a way, uh, integrate a relatively simple concept of uh, blend extrusion um, into uh, 3D printing uh, technology, therefore creating a new 3D printer head that enabled to create uh, uh, different kind of uh, physical and chemical uh, properties uh, while in, in the same layer. You see here on the bottom left uh, uh, a video uh, of a classical food dye into a polymeric carrier. On the right side, actually, a more functional uh, gradient being formed, where in general, in the context of bone regeneration, we were interested in two gradients of uh, inorganic fillers uh, from uh, the classical nanohydroxyapatite uh, uh, to recreate uh, um, osteoconductive uh, composites to uh, inorganic fillers that, for example, would be um, able to protect uh, uh, antibiotics such as uh, gentamicin or ciprofloxacin, uh, looking more at uh, um, adding further functionality onto this kind of uh, bone uh, implants. Of course, when uh, you look at uh, uh, the mechanical properties of these uh, um, differently uh, fabricated uh, uh, composite scaffolds, uh, there has been an, a, a large variety of mechanical properties that has been able to we have been able to achieve compared to the uh, blank uh, uh, polymer carrier. 
which again belongs to the same family of that POT PBT copolymers that we also showed uh, to, to be interesting candidates for uh, uh, cartilage regeneration. Now, in this case, we did use uh, the cell spreading um, uh, chemistry, which uh, uh, resulted also in, uh, in being more favorable for uh, bone regeneration. And we created different kind of uh, gradients uh, looking at possible different biological scenarios in uh, non-union uh, bone fractures. Either where uh, the continue, we will create, recreate the continuity of uh, uh, the uh, hydroxyapatite gradient from the distal part of uh, the fracture towards the middle, or vice versa, a sort of callus-like um, mimicry with higher concentration of uh, the hydroxyapatite content in the middle of the defect uh, and uh, a uh, decreasing amount uh, while going to the uh, distal uh, area of the bone fracture. But these kind of uh, continuous gradients are also much better performing from a mechanical point of, point of view. You can actually appreciate that from the videos that are running on the bottom of this slide. Well, again, this uh, discrete gradients uh, clearly uh, break at discrete areas where the different regions uh, are changing in composition, whereas the continuous gradients are much more uh, continuously performing, again, uh, mechanically speaking, and, and, and essentially they collapse before uh, breaking under compression. Uh, through uh, the work also of uh, a uh, former PhD uh, student in the lab, uh, working also in the same team uh, with Ravi and Maria, uh, we have been able also to uh, show how uh, in this kind of scaffolds, uh, we uh, were able to recreate the, um, a more classical biological um, coax of the um, mesenchymal stromal cells uh, to the osteogenic differentiation lineage with now, early ALP activity having a peak at uh, two weeks from uh, uh, the in vitro culture and late maturation uh, with expression of osteocalcin uh, five weeks uh, from uh, the uh, culture in vitro. Could these uh, uh, scaffolds also work as uh, inductive uh, um, implants? Possibly, yes. Again, you see here also that from a uh, calcification perspective, after five weeks, uh, not only there has been an increase in the amount of alizarin red staining, uh, showing therefore mineralization of the uh, form tissue in uh, mineralization media here shown with the uh, gray bars and, and MM, MM uh, in the legend, but even more interestingly in basic media. So without any soluble factors, uh, we clearly saw an increase in alizarin red staining with the highest amount of hydroxyapatite uh, uh, present in uh, uh, the scaffold up to 45% in uh, weight. We then uh, uh, tested this uh, scaffolds also in a uh, critical uh, bone size defect in, uh, in a rabbit model, in a rabbit ulnar model. And again, showed that this uh, uh, two gradient uh, system, uh, either having the HA gradient in the middle or uh, in the uh, distal area, uh, performed actually better than uh, uh, not only the polymeric scaffold alone, but see, interestingly, um, also performed better than a homogeneous scaffold uh, presenting a 45% uh, uh, nanohydroxyapatite content throughout uh, the full scaffold. Um, uh, certainly, we are still uh, far away from uh, uh, what uh, is the kind of uh, bridging uh, um, capacity of a positive control. In this case, it was a collagen uh, sponge embedded with BMP2. Uh, but it's interesting to see that uh, this kind of gradients uh, did um, show also an active role in an in vivo model. Also, interestingly, when uh, we added uh, an allogenic uh, source of MSCs, uh, the amount of bone formed uh, was significantly lower than uh, the acellular implants. Therefore, also thinking here that uh, with the right um, biological uh, structure and, and physiochemical design of uh, uh, these scaffolds, we can create uh, um, material-driven regeneration without uh, the aid of uh, cells. To further uh, increase also and show the uh, capacity of uh, this kind of technology to uh, uh, change in a multifactorial manner the uh, properties of these uh, 3D printed scaffolds, one could also think to interpolate another technology such as a plasma uh, um, torch, uh, which uh, would allow to deposit specific chemistry uh, while again printing uh, uh, every single layer of the scaffold. And again, in this case, we did uh, simple studies where we turned actually a material that was adhesive into a non-adhesive uh, uh, material in specific areas of the material itself. So what you see, for example, that in this case, that uh, 
um, the, the uh, plasma treated areas uh, became much more adhesive uh, and therefore colored and stained with, uh, with blue uh, by classical methylene blue staining uh, of uh, adhered cells. In this case, obviously, one, uh, what, what uh, one could imagine in the future is uh, to uh, create scaffolds also that can be, um, that can, uh, can be designed to host uh, uh, different kinds of cells, uh, depending again, for example, of the, how they interface between uh, uh, adjacent tissues uh, develop in our uh, body. And so here you see into different uh, colors, uh, to different kinds of cell types that have been selectively uh, adhered on uh, either the top or the bottom part of the scaffold. And then um, in a gradient fashion, uh, their density uh, changed uh, while going across uh, the uh, scaffold uh, um, longitudinal area. Oh, another uh, possible way of uh, creating uh, uh, active, biologically active scaffolds is actually to um, uh, provide uh, some way that the scaffold could um, be mechanically active uh, while uh, working actually and a little bit in our life uh, we, we stay sit sometimes but sometimes also we like to uh, do sport and do uh, some activity uh, and so also with uh, with our cells uh, it is important actually to um, uh, subject them into a specific mechanical stimulation protocols uh, depending on the tissue that we are interested into there are different ways that uh, this can be done. Certainly bioreactors uh, could be one way. Uh, in a thing way actually would be to really do it uh, uh, with a sort of uh, external triggered mechanical uh, um, uh, stimulation methods. And one of the ways actually that uh, we thought would be uh, most exciting was to use uh, ultrasound technology, which again in, uh, in uh, the clinics is, is already used uh, again in the context of complex uh, bone fractures to uh, stimulate the proliferation of uh, resident osteoblasts in the uh, fracture area. So in a way, actually, by changing the uh, frequency and the amplitude of the ultrasound uh, wave field, we asked a little bit if uh, our stem cells like better to listen to classic or to rock uh, music, uh, uh, if you wish. So this is also the work of a very skilled uh, uh, postdoc uh, in the lab that now is a group leader back in uh, uh, her own country, uh, Sandra, uh, who's now working at the University of Basque Country in, in Spain. Sandra was generally interested in creating uh, uh, scaffolds with uh, uh, clearly distinct uh, properties by uh, using a material um, phase separation uh, uh, methodologies. And so what she has done, was uh, to be able to recreate uh, Janos-like scaffolds by um, simply uh, exploring uh, the different uh, miscibility, cap miscibility capacity and viscosity of two very common polymers, such as polylactic acid and polycaprolactone. Now, for a 50-50 ratio of these two polymers, indeed, it was possible to create uh, uh, this kind of Janos-like fibers across uh, the scaffold. Um, this is interesting because, in fact, one of the two polymers act as a sort of backing material, whereas the other as a, uh, vibration material, a vibrating material when subjected to a um, ultrasound field. And so what uh, she has been able to show is that depending on the frequency, it was possible to then create some sort of nano vibrations onto the scaffold uh, ranging from uh, um, a few tens of nanometers to a couple of hundred of nanometers. This actually uh, resulted for a specific frequency of 40 kilohertz um, into significantly higher amount of fibronectin that has been deposited by MSCs uh, seeded on these scaffolds, higher amount of uh, uh, collagen one, uh, which was also associated by a, a selective ex uh, higher expression of uh, both early and late uh, osteogenically uh, related uh, genes. Uh, this also was re uh, associated to uh, an increased presence of uh, calcium phosphate deposit uh, looking at mineralization. And uh, in principle also, uh, we, we then uh, were interested to understand a little bit uh, the uh, biological uh, um, signaling that were responsible for this increase in uh, oxygenic differentiation up, uh, upon uh, the ultrasound stimulation. And we uh, showed uh, that um, this was uh, related to the activation of uh, um, ion-gated calcium channels. 
Now, of course, this kind of 3D printed technology is uh, useful at the macroscopic scale to provide uh, a uh, solid and, 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 uh, and stable uh, house, uh, if you wish, to uh, our cells and therefore influence their um, behavior uh, at uh, a population level, if you wish. One other possibility uh, to uh, influence cells actually at the more single cell level is uh, certainly uh, provided by electrospinning technologies. Now, I don't have to explain to you uh, what elect electrospinning is. Uh, certainly what uh, this kind of technology can do is uh, to provide different kind of uh, fiber uh, architecture by um, shaping either the electrostatic field or the collector geometry uh, where the uh, fibers are uh, deposited. Uh, now, another way actually that uh, we can create uh, uh, biologically inspired uh, features on this kind of scaffolds is to simple, uh, uh, simply provide some sort of buckling uh, deformation on the fibers while they are being uh, deposited on the collecting plate. And so actually with this uh, kind of simple uh, methodology, imagine you have a rope and then you really uh, uh, release the tension of the rope while the filaments or the threads of the rope are still being intertwined. Why this actually would be uh, interesting? So first of all, uh, let me show you first uh, uh, the capacity of uh, how in principle this, uh, this phenomena can allow to create uh, wavy patterns, uh, both at a single fiber level, as well as uh, at the mesh uh, size uh, level, depending essentially uh, on uh, the timing and the amount of material that has been deposited on the uh, collecting uh, plate. Uh, again, here a number of different examples, also showing uh, uh, different amplitudes uh, of uh, uh, these uh, wavy patterns on, on single fibers, depending on the material uh, that has been used or whether sacrificial materials uh, uh, have been used uh, also during the spinning uh, um, uh, fabrication uh, uh, process. Now, why actually this is important? Eh? Because if you look at many of the tissues in our body, uh, the collagen fibers uh, uh, in, in these tissues uh, does have this kind of wavy patterns and each tissue has its own specific uh, uh, wavy uh, waviness if you wish you, you see here uh, the top uh, first two examples uh, of collagen fibers in uh, our uh, uh, cardiac muscle uh, whereas for example in uh, the case of uh, uh, figure g and h uh, the waviness in uh, uh, ligaments in our body and uh, in the case of uh, figure i and j the waviness of uh, again collagen fibers into uh, the uh, uh, iris in our um, eyes. Obviously, from a, again, a biomechanical point of view, this results in uh, a, a modulation of the mechanical properties uh, of uh, uh, these uh, um, buckled scaffolds, if you wish. But uh, more interestingly, again, uh, one of the uh, major limitation and, and critiques that actually is being provided uh, to electrospan scaffolds is that oftentimes the cells just uh, stop at the surface of the scaffold. Now, if we are able to create this kind of more soft matter like uh, structure, uh, we were also able to uh, better uh, allow the migration and the repopulation of up to one centimeter in thickness uh, electrospan scaffold simply by just providing a much more amenable poor network for, uh, for the cells to, be, to, to deform it and to uh, migrate through the uh, scaffold itself. Actually came in a bit more uh, serendipitous manner uh, is that uh, not only there was a higher migration of uh, uh, the mesenchyma stem cells uh, seated on them, but uh, these cells also were able in the waved scaffolds to secrete much more uh, TGF beta and BMP2 uh, compared to uh, non wavy uh, scaffolds. So we don't know yet still the uh, reason uh, for, for this to happen. Again, we think it might be due to uh, mechanobiological uh, phenomena playing uh, a role on, on the wavy versus uh, the uh, straight uh, fibers. And in fact, actually, this is also something that uh, from a more fundamental point of view, we are getting more and more interested uh, into um, when uh, looking at how uh, cells in general, and in particular stem cells, uh, um, behave when cultured on this kind of 3D printed or electrospan scaffolds. Now, most of the time, mechanobiological uh, um, studies have been done in the context of regenerative medicine uh, uh, with hydrogels, but in fact, actually, also with stiffer materials such as solid polymers, uh, we uh, see that uh, uh, depending on the uh, dimensionality and on the fiber uh, features, 
the um, nuclear stiffness actually of uh, these cells uh, clearly is different than classical two-dimensional cultures. And so we have been looking specifically at the expression of lamin AC in this context and showed that in uh, additive manufacturers scaffolds uh, here called AMF or electrospan scaffolds again here called ASP, ESP uh, the uh, decrease in uh, lamin expression was significantly uh, lower than than uh, in uh, 2D uh, films made of the same polymer chemistry and this actually has been also replicated in two different kind of uh, uh, chemistries from uh, uh, polyactive which is again actually the commercial name of the POT PBT copolymers that I talked to you about uh, to uh, also the classical polystyrene, which is our uh, gold standard in terms of tissue culture, two-dimensional uh, plates. And so why actually this uh, uh, occurs? In principle, uh, uh, we have also um, hypothesized that this uh, could be related to a differential expression of uh, um, the focal adhesions of these cells as they touch upon the materials and adhere to the different to the three-dimensional networks. Uh, in fact, actually, this seems to be the case uh, where not only the cells in a uh, um, material, in a, in a porous material uh, that is less uh, stiff, uh, does also result in uh, a higher capacity of the cells to migrate through uh, the, um, the, the, the pore network, but also in 2D, uh, when, we would see, um, when we would silence actually lamin A, uh, we would uh, again result, uh, show a, a decrease of uh, uh, the amount of focal adhesion and the specific focal adhesions that have been formed on the 2D uh, plates itself. So again, uh, showing a correlation, a direct correlation between lamin expression and uh, focal adhesion formation. And in particular, actually, this uh, has been uh, related to a relatively mature form of uh, focal adhesions, and in, in particular on the formation of uh, uh, zixin. Uh, this has also been related to a, a differential expression of uh, YAP uh, um, translocation, as well as of uh, phosphorylated uh, myosin light uh, uh, chain uh, two, um, and ultimately um, has resulted in uh, uh, also playing a uh, major role in the predisposition of uh, uh, these cells uh, towards the uh, differentiation into the osteogenic lineage uh, compared to the classical uh, adipogenic lineage in a uh, mixed uh, cultural environment where uh, the soluble factors were uh, mixed one to one between osteogenic and adipogenic. Uh, um, soluble factors. So this actually is, is something that uh, we uh, would like to uh, explore more and more in the future, especially in the context of these mechanically actuatable uh, scaffolds, as I showed in the case of the Janus uh, scaffolds. Now, let me change in the last part of the uh, talk gears a little bit. Of course, here we have talked uh, always about uh, one tissue, maybe uh, two tissues uh, looking at an osteochondral interface, bone and cartilage together. But if we uh, consider this in the economy of uh, the complexity of our body, uh, this is just a, a relatively sim simplistic schematic of how our tissues develop. Uh, e even in the same context of skeletal tissues, uh, uh, considering then also blood vessels and neural networks uh, would certainly recreate a much more physiologically representative uh, uh, environment. It is in this context, actually, that we uh, are also looking at innervation uh, strategies. This is also the work that Paul Vieringa started as a PhD student first, a postdoc later, and now he uh, uh, is leading uh, with his own group uh, um, as a PI in, uh, in our department. Where actually, uh, Paul has created a very nice concept uh, in principle where it is possible in a gel by a specific electrospinning technology, which we call the tandem electrospinning, we create macroscopic and uh, nanoscopic uh, uh, aligned fibers embedded into the hydrogel, where then the microscopic fibers could be leached out, recreating channels now that are decorated by nanoscopic fibers uh, that act as sort of contact guidance uh, for uh, neurons uh, to then penetrate uh, through the uh, channel and arrive to the other side of the uh, gel construct. Again, as I say, this has been done by a technology called tandem electrospinning. You see here, how this kind of fibers then can be uh, further streamed into uh, the collecting plate in, uh, in different kind of aligned configurations, as well as uh, different kind of fibers can be placed uh, very much adjacent with each other. Uh, again, in, in a completely straight or, or straight uh, divergent uh, um, con configurations. 
Now, obviously, one of the first things that, for example, you could do is again to create uh, uh, divergent patterns of uh, adhesive and non-adhesive polymer chemistry. And again, in this case, we did see that uh, Schwann cells in, uh, in the specific case were able to preferentially uh, adhere to the adhesive chemistry compared to the non-adhesive uh, uh, chemistry of the polymer used. But we then uh, would uh, uh, embed these uh, fibers into the gel constant and put on the other side of the gel a specific soluble factors. Depending on the soluble factors uh, used in the in a neural context, uh, if we would put on the uh, sink side a uh, dorse root ganglia, which is a sort of neurosphere um, containing different kinds of uh, uh, sensory neurons, we would actually be able to extract from the DRG uh, specific subpopulations of sensory neural cells uh, that would actually go through the channels and reach out uh, on the other side of the hydrogel construct. Similarly, if we would uh, now uh, functionalize this kind of uh, scaffolds with two different kinds of peptides, either a neuromimetic peptide or a classical RGD peptide, and again, would place a DRG body in the middle of these two um, uh, differently functionalized uh, fiber populations, we would be able to either direct uh, a higher neural extension on the area uh, that is um, uh, functionalized with a neuromimetic peptide versus a uh, higher migration of uh, Schwann cells uh, on the RGD functionalized uh, uh, area of the scaffold. Therefore, also again here playing with the way that, uh, for example, by scaffold designing, we can uh, um, either induce a higher uh, neurite extension and therefore higher neural uh, regeneration uh, as well as uh, higher uh, Schwann cell migration, therefore looking at uh, um, the possibility of remyelinating remi uh, uh, this uh, uh, Axons. And this actually, of course, can be quantified uh, with proper imaging software. Um, but I think actually that the previous images uh, showed more um, eloquently the concept that I wanted to um, introduce. Also, with the same uh, electrospinning technology, you could create uh, uh, this uh, kind of hexagonal like or honeycomb uh, uh, structures. Again, here replicating a little bit. Uh, uh, the kind of uh, typical uh, blood vessel network in uh, in, our, in many of our tissues. Now, again, in many cases, uh, this kind of blood network is what you typically see in a tubular assay in uh, uh, matrigel, for example, when this kind of, when, when typically endothelial cells are uh, seeded on top of matrigel. And, and so actually here with a completely synthetic uh, form of, uh, of a fibrillar material with the proper geometrical configuration, we were able to again recreate this kind of tubular structures simply by actually mimicking the same sort of hexagonal-like uh, uh, blood vessel network uh, in a synthetic uh, uh, mesh, um, such as this one created by Electrospin. And this also is, is a nice uh, feature that, again, in the future we would like to combine with the neural network uh, that I introduced just uh, a few minutes ago. Obviously, when you think about uh, multiple cells and multiple tissues coming together towards uh, organ, uh, or, or patches uh, for, for organ, uh, for, for a partial uh, regeneration of, a, of, a, of, a, of an organ. Bioprinting technologies are also coming uh, into uh, our mind. Uh, again, here, some of the most beautiful work comes uh, certainly from, uh, from the group of uh, Ali and from many of the colleagues uh, at the Terazaki Institute. Uh, I'd like to show also here just briefly what we um, do uh, in the context of bioprinting here at uh, the Merlin Institute, uh, where we actually are able nowadays to use diff the different kind of palette of bioprinting technologies from the classical continuous extrusion bioprinting to uh, drop on demand bioprinting to more recently also uh, magnetic and acoustic levitation uh, uh, bioassembly uh, methodologies. So, and the bioprinting platform is also led by uh, another PI in the department, Carlos Mota, who has a clear uh, in focus and interest on uh, kidney uh, in vitro models. But you see here that there are a number of other uh, tissue applications that we are uh, working on also in the context of creating new hydrogels as new bioinks that can better mimic the uh, dynamicity of our extracellular matrix. And actually it's, it's, it's this example that I would like to show. Uh, in fact, uh, that this has always been a conundrum in uh, the hydrogel and, and cell culture field where typically uh, we have wonderful hydrogels that, uh, for cell culture, but they are not able to maintain the shape of the uh, final construct that we want to recreate or vice versa. 
uh, great shape fidelity hydrogens that are not good for maintaining the right uh, uh, cell nutrition environment for uh, proper tissue formation. There are many, uh, again, examples in the field where now newer and newer chemistries are being uh, uh, developed. I'd like to show here again the work of uh, another PI in the department, Matt Baker, uh, with whom uh, we, we actually do a lot of work uh, in collaborations in the context of uh, uh, changing uh, what are normally static hydrogels, such as alginate, into um, dynamic hydrogels. And this can be easily done, for example, by changing the uh, dynamicity of the crosslinker that is being used to form uh, um, uh, the crosslinked uh, hydrogel network. These gels, in the end, have uh, self-filling properties, can also be bioprinted. Interestingly, again, by changing the um, dynamicity of the crosslinker, we are also able, again, to impinge on the cell morphology uh, from a completely rounded to a completely spread uh, uh, morphology of the stem cells that have been uh, cultured into uh, these uh, hydrogen networks. And this, again, is something that we are very much excited uh, about and that um, surely in the future we will be also connecting to uh, the capacity of uh, uh, differentiating cells uh, in a dynamic manner, also through uh, providing different mechanical uh, biological stimuli uh, on uh, this kind of uh, hydrogen networks. Now, let me finish actually with one last uh, example of uh, a, um, uh, a number of different uh, efforts that uh, went back again in time and that resulted now in a clinical product. Um, nowadays, if you think about uh, something that we, we, we do, is we, we can create different kinds of uh, scaffolds uh, with, with different kinds of features, with different kinds of materials. At the end of the day, when we actually uh, implant this into the body, uh, they will always have a, a foreign body reaction, right? So that, that kind of uh, reaction in the end uh, will create a fiber, uh, fibrous encapsulation, which actually can jeopardize all the very nice uh, design and engineering efforts that we have uh, a priori in, uh, in uh, the effort in, 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 the, in the path towards uh, clinical translation. So in the end, you know, the more or the less, if you have an hydrophilic or hydrophobic uh, material or a different kind of chemistry or a soft or a hard material, the same result is that you will actually have a fiber encapsulation. Now, can you change uh, the composition of the, the fiber encapsulation and therefore the, the, bio the biology of the foreign body reaction by actually engineering the material again that you are um, implanting? And, yeah, the, the question is a bit rhetorical because in my opinion, the answer is yes. And again, this is not just me, but a number of different people in the field that are uh, using this kind of concept where ideally we would like to steer not only stem cell behavior, but now also the uh, behavior of immune cells such as macrophages uh, at the uh, contact with this kind of uh, biomedical implants uh, after implantation. <clears throat> and so the story is... Uh, now uh, much more complex than uh, the uh, original idea of having just only one, uh, uh, sorry, two different uh, types of macrophages, a, a pro-inflammatory or a pro-healing phenotype and one or and two. In the meantime, we know that there is a pattern of different kind of uh, sub-phenotypes uh, of macrophages, all uh, actually uh, contributing to uh, a either more inflammatory or a more uh, regenerative environment. Now, where this actually could be useful in a medical application, uh, together with uh, a nephrologist uh, uh, group uh, from uh, Leiden University Medical Center, also here in the Netherlands, a, a wonderful work from uh, uh, Joris Rotmans, um, we have been able actually to design a, a strategy to recreate a blood vessel for dialytic patients. These patients typically suffer from uh, uh, tremendous cardiovascular problems uh, because of the fact that every other day they keep uh, uh, they need to, to keep being uh, attached to a, a dialysis machine to change uh, uh, their blood and purify it. So uh, as a consequence, after a few years of uh, this kind of routine, uh, doctors actually literally cannot find anymore the veins uh, where uh, to connect the dialytic machine. So what actually we, saw, we, we thought with Yoris was uh, to um, create a simple polymeric crot, uh, like my finger now on the screen, which would be implanted into uh, the body of the patient after a few weeks. In principle, you could remove the construct, uh, remove the polymeric crot, and then come out with a fiber capsule, which now would be a kind of hollow pipe. Now, if the hollow pipe would have the proper extracellular matrix composition, it could also be uh, considered as a uh, blood vessel. 
Would that work? Now, indeed, we have screened first a number of different surface uh, uh, modification treatments uh, from gas plasma to chemically etching, and uh, uh, showed indeed that depending on the uh, specific uh, topography uh, that resulted into the um, polymeric rod, it was possible indeed to impinge on the kind of activity of macrophages in terms of interleukin uh, uh, production, but also the amount of uh, and the type of extracellular matrix produced by uh, dermal fibroblast, uh, not only in the case of collagen, as you see in this uh, first graph, but also importantly for blood vessel in the case of uh, elastin production, which has been always a uh, difficult uh, protein to uh, be synthesized artificially in uh, tissue engineering concept. Now, would actually this concept work again? Here you see the polymeric rods that have been implanted now in the belly of uh, a uh, model. After four weeks, uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, engineered uh, fiber capsule uh, is being retrieved. You can see that this actually can be removed from the polymeric rod in a relatively simple manner. And again, in vivo, uh, we see uh, uh, also a last information in addition to um, uh, a, a few other markers of uh, uh, typical of uh, blood vessel uh, uh, formation, uh, also not only in the context of endothelialization, but also in the context of the smooth muscle uh, presence uh, on the secondary part of the blood vessel, therefore also creating a contractile uh, structure. This kind of structure also has uh, mechanical properties that are similar to uh, the uh, local uh, veins and, and, and other kind of biological graphs that are typically used nowadays as a, a clinical uh, a golden standard. Now, if you take this uh, engineered uh, blood vessel and put it into a carotid artery uh, model, uh, after again four weeks, we had a patency of uh, close to 90% of the cases. Again, with a further maturation of the tissue that has been formed, further increase in the amount of uh, elastin, uh, further increase in the amount of smooth muscle uh, presence, and also important uh, uh, positive endothelialization as shown, for example, by lectin uh, perfusion. Uh, again, you see here also from an extracellular matrix point of view, a significant increase of the content of elastin. Interestingly, also a lack of calcification, which for blood vessel, for engineered blood vessel is an important feature to, uh, to have um, if you want to have long-term patency. Now, from a peak model, we went again uh, on an even larger model, a GOAT model in this case. Again, the um, framework and the workflow was the same. And again, this kind of engineered blood vessel resulted in a carotid model, uh, model uh, to be patent and fully mature into a, a fully functional blood vessel. Now, again, this, uh, um, and again, you see here a number of different proteins, uh, both uh, in terms of elastin as well as in terms of uh, endothelial uh, layer formation and of contractile features that uh, have been maturing uh, uh, with the uh, blood vessel uh, uh, insertion into the model. We have also looked into uh, <clears throat> the presence again of the uh, foreign body response and specifically of uh, uh, macrophage uh, population. And again, also here we showed that there has been an increase of uh, pro healing uh, uh, macrophage uh, in, uh, in the tissue resident and the depletion in time of the pro inflammatory uh, macrophages. And again, here you see uh, at a closer, uh, with a closer look, uh, the endothelialization of uh, this engineered blood vessel uh, in not a two different way than, for example, the carotid artery. Now this, and sorry, I, I keep now uh, trying to shorten up because my time is also up. Uh, this also is, has been also shown uh, not to be uh, uh, thrombotic as a blood vessel and therefore in a, again, in vitro setting to avoid uh, the um, addition of uh, blood platelet uh, uh, while flowing, actually blood flow into the uh, biological graft. So what I want to say actually that is this, this graft is now has now passed also clinical phase 1A uh, and 1B and is now um, being geared up to a phase 2 clinical trial. <clears throat> now with this, I'd like also to end my talk. Again, this is not just my work, it's the work of an immense uh, amount of uh, skilled uh, uh, people. And, and actually it's a team of teams, if you wish, where four different uh, PIs uh, uh, come together uh, you see me on the on the screen now, but uh, on the top side, you see also Matt Baker, uh, Paul Vieringa, and Carlos uh, uh, Mota, who uh, lead together with me the uh, complex tissue regeneration department, and uh, where together we have a number of uh, highly collaborative projects uh, uh, with different uh, PhD students and postdocs. 
uh, coming from different disciplines in uh, uh, the uh, in this interdisciplinary field. Obviously, uh, this would not be possible without uh, uh, funding bodies. Uh, you see, uh, uh, in addition to the face, also the names of uh, the, the uh, group members, uh, together also with some of the uh, main collaborators in the field. And again, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity, and I would be happy to take any question. Uh, dear Lorenzo, thank you for the fantastic talk. You covered so many things. Uh, you know, there's a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned about microphages and different material uh, reactions. Uh, did you look into dimensions, how they deal with micro nano dimensions and microphages? If you take a nanofiber, which you mentioned, or a micro, uh, you know, a few micrometer substrate, how do they respond? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question, Ahmed. Uh, um, we have not looked at it as much as I uh, should have. Uh, we, we have now done some, some studies uh, that these are not published yet, where um, indeed we have a special construct uh, looking at uh, blending actually macro fibers with 3D printing with micro fibers with electrospinning. And we are there indeed looking at uh, the different population in terms of M1 and M2 uh, macrophages. Um, but I don't have yet a clear in my mind if, um, at least if in our hands, we do see a difference in terms of the uh, fiber dimension. Um, my gut feeling would, would say that probably this is the case. Um, if you also correlate with the work, uh, with, the, with, the, with the wonderful work, for example, of um, Buddy Ratner in terms of, in this case, not necessarily fiber dimension, but pore size. It's clear that, uh, for example, the pore dimensions uh, does play an important role in uh, uh, the pro-healing versus pro-inflammatory uh, phenotype of, of resident macrophages. Uh, so, so I would certainly expect that also the fiber dimension would have an effect. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you mentioned um, that classical versus rust rock music in the cells. It was a beautiful slide. Uh, did you play with the amplitude or frequency in addition to the type of music? Yeah, yeah, we played certainly with the frequency uh, and uh, uh, we didn't play too much with the amplitude. I think also there, there, there has to be uh, certainly something at play. Uh, now also in a, in a different project together with, uh, with Carlos, uh, we have also a, a very skilled PhD student uh, named Shivesh. Uh, who uh, works on tympanic membrane uh, regeneration. And there also we are looking at uh, the, the capacity of, of applying different kind of acoustic uh, um, mechanical stimulation. And there indeed also with amplitude, we still, we seem to see uh, indeed some, some positive effect in terms of ECM formation. Thank you, thank you. There were a lot of postdocs uh, listening. I just wanna um, get your opinion as the world expert in you know, this area. What are the 10 open problems, you know, what are some open problems that people who are starting their careers can work on over the next 10, 20 years? Is it vascularization? Is it the cell source, IPS? What's your view? What do you think you'll be working on 10 years down the road? So if I would start my PhD now again, I think I would definitely look at the interplay between uh, um, blood vessels and, and um, neural networks. Uh, much more and not uh, think of them separately, but as an ensemble. Uh, I would certainly uh, dive much more into the immune system uh, beyond macrophages. Again, if you look at the, I mean, for some, again, of the very, very nice and elegant work from Jennifer Lissif uh, on, on uh, uh, Treg cells or, or, or also uh, B cells uh, in the context of regeneration, but also in the context of uh, aging or senescent. I think that also would be at the interface with biomaterials would be a, a place where we still need to understand a lot more, uh, especially then when also thinking about uh, putting back the same strategy into a patient, right? So oftentimes the patient would be an aged patient. In some cases, maybe a, a young patient because of traumatic uh, accident, but certainly this difference between aging and, and, and rejuvenation in a way with the kind of engineered tissue that we would uh, uh, implant into an aged uh, patient is something that we also need to understand uh, much uh, more. That I think is on the biological side. On the technological side, I think 
we need uh, to um, go much more into multi functional multi-material constructs, which may complicate the spectrum of uh, uh, technology um, options that we have. And, and, and that also may require, uh, you know, also some um, more frequent dialogues with, with clinicians. But I think especially when we look at complex defects where multiple tissues with multiple cells are coming together, uh, it's inevitable that uh, we need to have technologies that can uh, better uh, dispense in uh, in precise location uh, uh, different materials for different biological functions. Thank you, thank you. The question came in, what polymers was used for fiber fabrication of neural cell regeneration? Did you use the cells only or did you use the animal model? And how long did it take for the, to grow the cells? No, we did use a synthetic uh, material platform. Again, uh, we often use this uh, um, copolymer of polyethylene oxide terephthalate and polybutylene terephthalate because the, 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 actually the effort is not necessarily into the chemistry of the polymer itself, but into how we can change the surface chemistry or how we can change the structural properties of the scaffolds to then influence a specific cell uh, behavior. Uh, so that actually was a synthetic uh, uh, material. Uh, and uh, um, I don't remember on top of my head, but I think actually we did achieve up to um, more than I think 1.5 centimeter in uh, neural extension uh, in 14 days, if I remember correctly, in terms of timing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, that's all the questions I have, Lorenzo. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Right. Thank you again, uh, Mehmet. And uh, thanks again, Ali, as well. And have a lovely day on your side. You too. I'll you get too. Uh, ready for dinner here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right.